Well, Michael, I wonder if you could give us your impressions of, uh, of what we just saw and, and uh, mission success. Well, it's hard to tell what we saw there. Uh, I'm, not sure. I'm not sure if the gain was uh, set there uh, correctly or what. Um, we had some uh, confirmation uh, from the mock that uh, they did uh, have a thermal signature. Yeah. Um, I should mention that uh, the nine instruments on the trailing spacecraft, the L-Cross spacecraft, were exercised on the way to the to the moon. In fact, we took images on the way and images of the Earth, so we're confident the, uh, the instruments performed as expected. Uh, at the time of the impacts, the uh, mothership, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, our sister ship, I should say, was uh, about 50 kilometers overhead. They will have their first, and so they should have been uh, seeing this with their suite of instruments. Uh, they do their first data downlink in about uh, two hours or so. So we hope to have the data, and I expect we will be receiving both uh, imaging data and spectroscopic data from the host of ground-based observatories probably within the next few hours. I think it is fair to say that uh, within this uh, $79 million cost cap, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the experiment had been optimized to produce the largest possible impact plume. And so I remain confident that uh, this is our best opportunity to date to measure the extent of water ice on the moon. So what we're seeing here is a replay of that impact. Let's watch it for a little bit. Yeah, even though there were nine instruments on the trailing L-Cross spacecraft, which you see going in here, uh, they basically break into three categories. There was something called a flash radiometer which uh, should have uh, seen the uh, flash and uh, by virtue of analyzing that signal we can make some inferences about the depth of the regolith and it's uh, the makeup of the dirt as it were that were th was thrown up by the centaur impact. Right, so then, brighter flash means you know hit rock or, and dimmer means it uh, hit dirt essentially. Right, and actually you would want a, a dim flash here because that uh, is suggestive that you hit sandy material and you want to throw up as much of that as possible and that's easier to throw up than uh, boulders. Then there's a suite of cameras, visible, near-infrared, mid-infrared, that provide information uh, once we analyze the signal, uh, once we analyze the data on the shape of the ejecta cloud, which contains both regolith and uh, hopefully water vapor. Uh, it tells us about the dust grain properties in the ejecta cloud and provides spatial context for the uh, spectrometers. And then finally, there is the suite of uh, spectrometers. Uh, and most of the information, much of the valuable information, will come out of the near-infrared spectrometer, which uh, provides uh, uh, analysis of the chemical composition of the vapor in the regolith and uh, any possible hydrated minerals. Hey, Michael, we're, we've just brought up the uh, thermal IR. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, I wonder if you uh, could comment a little bit on Well, the, uh, the blue areas are the cooler regions, and so the green and the red are increasingly warm regions, and so you can imagine the sun being uh, beating down on the south rim of that crater. That's why it's showing up as red. This is all false colored, of course, uh, and of course we're aiming for the blue region, uh, which is the uh, permanently shadowed region here. The reason you have this many instruments is uh, we're trying to tease out, uh, particularly with spectrometers, the way I like to phrase it to people is we break light into its uh, color constituents and then we look for li little squiggles superimposed on big squiggles. Yes. And uh, the little squiggles are hopefully the signatures of water and uh, other hydrated minerals. The big squiggles are just the electronic noise in the cameras, and so even though the data will become available to us in the next few hours from uh, the other uh, orbiting and ground-based assets, I anticipate it will take a couple of days before we can calibrate out the big squiggles and, and, and get into the, uh, the uh, little squiggles. And we want to have some redundancy in the instrumentation. That's why we have multiple instruments looking at slightly different wavelengths. So the whole idea here is collect as much data as you can and minimize any ambiguity in the interpretations as you try to analyze those small squiggles. Well, we have redundancy not only on, on uh, L-Cross, but of course with all the ground assets right. from the Earth, the Hubble, um, and LRO, like you mentioned. As we begin to collect the data and we analyze it, 
If we don't find water, is that a significant finding in itself? It is, uh, because of the reasons I stated earlier, <clears throat> excuse me, and that is because the experiment has been carefully designed to maximize the uh, uh, amount of material thrown up. That's by the uh, mass of the impactor. It is the largest impactor we have uh, utilized on the lunar surface. And by the uh, impact angle, we went in at an impact angle of over 80 degrees, so it's basically straight on. And so if we do have a negative uh, signal when we uh, finish analyzing the data in the next few days, it means one of three things. First of all, there may be no water on the moon, although that would seem to contravene the announcement made a few weeks ago right. from the other spacecraft. So that leaves two possibilities. It means there may be water concentrations, but it's at less than the half a percent sensitivity of Alcross which has ramifications, uh, potential ramifications on the ability to extract that as a resource. And the third possibility is that the water in the permanently, the frozen water in the permanently shadowed regions is not uniformly distributed, but rather is in patches. And like uh, an old uh, Texas uh, wildcatter, we may have hit a dry hole rather yes. than a wet hole. Right. So that's part of the reason we uh, sent the Centaur impactor and the following Elcross uh, spacecraft on separate pro trajectories at the end so they would impact two possible points. I can say that uh, regardless of the results of this experiment, whether we have detected water, water or whether we have established an upper limit uh, through a null result, uh, the results will help advance our knowledge by constraining the current models or explanations uh, pertaining to uh, the moon. Uh, like all scientific discovery, uh, it rules out some explanations. It may advance the likelihood of others. That's just the normal process of scientific discovery and advancing our understanding of the universe. So all, all indications are that the instruments were working and, uh, and no matter what we find, it's going to be important. Uh, indeed. I should mention, too, that part of the reason it's going to take us a few days to uh, tease out the right answer here is because uh, we are, if you return to my uh, original four science objectives for the mission, we're looking for more than just a yes-no answer. We are looking for quantitative answers. And so it's very uh, likely that when you assemble data uh, looking for, like I said, uh, small signals, from uh, a family of 20 observatories, they're not all going to give you the same answer. And so we need to cross-calibrate the results from each of the uh, observatories, too. And they help uh, reinforce our understanding and give us greater faith that uh, we have come up with the right answer. I really can't think of any other event that's similar where we had all of these assets trained on such a small uh, area of the sky, if you will. Yeah, certainly the only uh, comparable uh, event was the Shoemaker-Levy 9 impact on right. Jupiter. Uh, we had some advance warning of that, uh, but this is uh, certainly the first time we've deployed this network for lunar purposes. Yeah, yeah so this is it's kind of an exciting time for NASA Ames. We've had a mission, we looks it appears we had a successful impact. Data will be particularly uh, exciting six months, I think, here at Ames. Uh, we had the launch of Kepler. Uh, the commissioning is complete. It's begun its uh, science investigation searching for Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone around other stars. Uh, I've seen some of the early data. It looks very promising. I think Kepler will, uh, at the end of its three-and-a-half-year mission, will determine the frequency of Earth-sized Earth planets in the local universe. Uh, we have uh, the Elcross uh, mission here. We had a small, uh, another small secondary uh, launch a few months ago of a mission called Pharmasat, which was a biological experiment on a uh, uh, Department of Defense mission. We have more of those coming up. And then, of course, uh, next month we start open-door flights on the uh, SOFIA. Infrared Pete Ward may have more to say on that uh, shortly. But uh, the pr primary purpose of that mission will be to study the uh, thin, tenuous lunar exosphere uh, before astronauts go back to the moon and start disturbing that exosphere. I guess one way we could say it is, is that there's, there, there is small satellites are, like this are not going to replace the big ones. Um, you know, we need the big ones, but there is a place for them. 
Would you agree with that? I, I've always believed that. I think uh, if, uh, if you look at the various National Research Council uh, Academy studies that come out every 10 years in the various space science disciplines, they consistently advocate 